Did you know that Virginia is the birthplace of American whiskey? Well, they've been making it there since 1607, and Catoctin Creek has been honoring that tradition of small craft rye whiskey since 2009. Virginia grain, Virginia water, and Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Wilderness Trail is sweet mash Kentucky straight bourbon and rye whiskey made by master distiller Shane Baker and fermentation expert Dr. Pat Heist. Whether it is high rye or weeded, cask strength or bottled and bond, Wilderness Trail is always non-chill filtered premium whiskey with unparalleled flavor. Distilled, aged and bottled in Danville, Kentucky. Certified Angus beef is the upper two thirds of choice. They also have to be, their their cattle have basically have to be 51% Angus. So it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> no it's way. kind of like bourbon. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's episode 328 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen, and I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. You know, one time I read a meme that said, as soon as a man enters his 30s, there's two hobbies he picks up. It's whiskey and smoking meats. Well, I'm guilty for it, and I know Ryan and Fred are as well, because there's nothing better than starting the fire in your grill and preparing for the long night ahead to make sure your brisket is done and juicy. I know when I started cooking on my big green egg, I went to the resource where you go to learn everything on the internet, and that's YouTube. Immediately, I was hooked onto a channel called How to Barbecue Right. I learned the 10 different ways to smoke ribs, how to make game day burgers, and even a delicious pot roast from our guest today, Malcolm Reed. Malcolm has made a name for himself in the barbecue competition circuit and he's turned it into one of the largest barbecue places on the internet. You can find him on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, I mean, literally everywhere, talking how to make barbecue and just other crazy good meals that you can do on a smoker. Malcolm joins us not to only talk about barbecue, Wagyu steaks, dry rub versus sauce, but he's also a huge bourbon fan, and you can catch him drinking Buffalo Trace or E.H. Taylor quite frequently on his channels. And also, don't forget to subscribe to his podcast, it's called, well, you guessed it, How to Barbecue Right. And don't forget, we now have Friday releases called This Week in Bourbon, where Ryan and I, we cover the latest on what's happening in bourbon news. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcast. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Ben Flowerday, who writes me on Twitter, at Ben Flowerday, by the way. If I take a job with the distributor out of college to get my foot in the door, does that make me one of the bad guys? Great question, Ben. And if you can get a job with a distributor out of college, you're going to have some coin. You know, those guys, you know, they make eighty to $120,000 a year. Uh, but, you know, they're working their tails off. They're, uh, they're slinging every kind of crap vodka you can possibly imagine and uh flavored gin and yeah i think i have even seen him like uh, promoting cigarettes from time to time so it's uh it's not an easy job you go to a lot of clubs a lot of dive bars you know a lot of places that you wouldn't want to and you know most people starting out they're not selling uh blantons but if you are willing to put the time in uh i think it's a great place to learn the industry I think distributors get a bad rap, and there are some of them that deserve um, the criticism they get. But for the most part, they're just hardworking, you know, people trying to put food on the table for their family. So no, I don't think that makes you a bad guy. I think that actually makes you pretty smart uh, because you're wanting to get in on the ground floor and kind of see how the business is is played. Just do me a favor. Just do me a favor here, Ben. Don't be one of those distributors that makes up uh, rumors to retailers who then pass it on to uh, pass it on to consumers. That is so annoying when distributors do that. And uh, hey, 
I get it. They got to tell the retailer something. If the comment starts with, well, I heard this, well, I heard that, you know, if you don't have a direct from the source, then, you know, don't share it. But uh, that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Ben, I hope you get that job. I hope you get that job. Good luck. If you want to be like Ben, uh, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or go to fredminnick.com and just click that contact button and send me your idea for Above the Char. Until next week, cheers. Barrel Craft Spirits sources different spirits and barrels from all over the world to create a -a one-of-a-kind tasting experience. Find out more at barrelbourbon.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. The whole team here today to talk about something that we all really enjoy because uh, we are self-proclaimed barbecue guys here, I guess is the best way you could say it. You know, uh, I've got myself a green egg. I know Ryan's got, what do you you got? The uh, pit barrel, right? Yeah, and I know Malcolm uses one. I saw him drilling uh, tomahawk the other day for his, uh, with it, to using the pit barrel. So he knows what's up. Me and him are the true professionals. (laughs) Screw those green eggs. No. <laughs> what about you, Fred? I know you, I know you love yourself some barbecue too. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm more uh, I'm actually a certified uh, Kansas City barbecue judge, and uh, and of course uh, you are. I, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and I wrote I wrote this book uh, on uh, the the history of certified Angus beef. So I I, I do uh, I, back in the day I did a lot of a uh, lot of coverage of uh, the barbecue world through uh through that lens so it, yeah i i would consider myself uh, far more a fan than a, uh than a barbecue maker but i got a weber grill i'm old school and um i love it i absolutely love it well cool i think we're gonna we're gonna get into this it's gonna be a fun conversation today talking bourbon talking barbecue so i'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guest so today on the show we have malcolm reed he's the pit master and rub blender for killer hogs He's the content creator for all things of how to barbecue right that you can find on their website, YouTube, as well as TikTok. And they also have a brick and mortar store in Hernando, Mississippi, which is just outside of Memphis. And he also has another podcast, unsurprisingly called How to Barbecue Right with Malcolm Reed. So Malcolm, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I've been looking forward to this, man. Yeah, too. for sure. I mean, I've been a big fan of your work for a while because, as I'd mentioned, we're all kind of like self-proclaimed barbecue people. And I remember when I got my green egg, the first thing that most of us do, we start searching the web for recipes of just literally anything we can make. And I came across your not not your mama's pot roast quite a while ago. And I've made that about a half a dozen times. And I'm just a a huge fan of it. There's something about, man, you put that pot roast on the smoker, get some good grill flavor going on it, you know, get some hardwood on it. And then you break it down like your mom would a pot roast. It tastes so much better than cooking it in a crock pot or a roaster in the oven. <laughs> oh, for sure. Heck but, yeah. you know, you're also a bourbon guy as well because I've seen your videos drinking Eagle Rare and E.H. Taylor, but I know you're a big Miller Lite guy too. So <laughs> before we get into kind of talk about the drinking and, uh, you know, barbecue and stuff like that, I kind of want to talk about, you know, your journey into barbecue. Kind of talk about how this passion uh, grew into a business and ultimately, you know, getting, you know, millions of subscribers on YouTube and stuff like that. Well, mine started a competition barbecue. Um, we, you know, being close to Memphis, Memphis and May is, you know, one of the, if not the biggest pork cooking contest in the world. And so we've all, I've grown up, you know, going to barbecue events around locally. Uh, me and my brother um, jumped on a team when we were in high school and we kind of took it over as the older guys decided to quit. That's where we got the Killer Hogs names. And I met my wife in 04. We were going to a contest and, and, uh, you know, she started hanging out with us and fell in love with it too. And she said, man, you got to share some of this, not, you know, some of this barbecue knowledge that you guys are gaining, um, going out and cooking these contests. And so we started a newsletter that was, you know, just a basic newsletter. It grew into making videos as YouTube came along. It was just a better medium for us to kind of show what we were doing. And we never had any idea it was going to turn into a business, but we just stayed with it. We, you know, I, I still do a newsletter. I still make my YouTube videos and I still go out and do competition barbecue. So uh, we have a lot of fun. It's a, it's a full-time job for, for me and Rochelle, but um, you know, it, it feels like, you know, we're doing something we're loving, and we're passionate about. So it's not like we're going to work every day. You know, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, making videos are, is one thing and then actually opening up your own brick and mortar store is a completely other thing as well. Kind of talk about the, the idea of saying, you know, I think we could, 
we could actually have something we could call home here and actually sell product out our back door. Yeah, that was that was kind of by accident too. I mean, we since we started selling online, it was always just me and Rochelle fulfilling daily orders. And then we got to where it was so busy, it was taking eight hours of our day just packing and shipping that we realized quick that we had to find other solutions. So we we started working with the 3PL company who does all that for us. But as we as that grew, we needed help management. So we had to add employees. And we we did it out of our home until we got tired of, you know, people coming to our house daily to work. And so we found a small office and then we rented that. And then another building came up that was perfect. It was like an Aflac insurance agency that had plenty of small offices in it. So we, we you know, went to the bank and made the numbers work and we ended up buying a building. And up front, it had like a conference room. We said, well, we're not going to use that. Um, so I said, why don't we just open up a little small shop where we can sell our rubs and sauces to local people to where they're not having to pay shipping or if someone comes to Hernando to see us, they've got a place where they can come buy something. And that's, that's kind of what we created here, but we're selling grills. We're selling, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a guy's boutique. We've got knives, cutting boards, rub sauces. Of course, we've got several models of grills. We've got crawfish cooking supplies. We've got a little bit of it all in there oh. and it all stemmed from just the idea to, to have a little retail shop to where people could buy something locally. And it's, it's, it's doing really well. I can see Ryan's mouth salivating over there. Yes. <laughs> like just dreaming right now. I can't even think of questions because I'm just like enamored by it all. <laughs> so kind of talk a, a little bit about, you know, the kind of like where you started in your barbecue journey as well of, of you know, the competitions. Was it all ribs, brisket? Like kind of talk about how how that led you down that path too. So the, the Memphis and May uh, contest or organization um, is is all pork centric, so you have to cook ribs, pork shoulder, whole pork shoulder, and whole hogs. So that's what we grew up. That's what we learned to cook. Um, you know, we started out in the rib division, but then as you know, as we started doing really well and winning some contests in ribs, we started learning to cook whole shoulders, and then we started learning to cook whole hogs, and we've done it all. Um, that was kind of my um, barbecue education there. And, the, and and we have so many world champions that live right around this Memphis area where I live within 30 miles of Memphis. It's just a, a port Mecca. And, um, you know, it's either learn to cook or get laughed out of town. And so we didn't have any choice. We practiced all the time. We cooked all the time. We learned everything we could. We soaked up at contests when, when the old guys would pull you over and, you know, give you some advice. We took all of that, put it all to work and, and, and came up with our own way of doing things at Killer Hogs. Then we got into KCBS cooking, which Fred mentioned. He's a KCBS judge. And that's when you added the chicken, the brisket. Uh, you started cooking pork butts instead of whole pork shoulders. And it was just a different style. Though. Um, in, in KCBS, they cook St. Louis cut spare ribs instead of the baby backs, which we were accustomed and learned how to cook in Memphis. So it was like learning a whole other set of, of barbecue style for us to go out and to be competitive on the KCBS circuit. And so we took that, and that's what my wife probably got sick of me talking about all the time to my buddies, was how to do, you know, what are we doing on ribs this week? Are we changing anything? What recipes are we working? She heard me talking that all the time. That was all we talked about. Um, and, and so that's where she got the idea, look, you got to share some of this. So all of my early day stuff was competition-oriented. Well, you can only talk about competition barbecue for so long. So I started exploring, and I started you know, jumping on the barbecue forums. There weren't guys doing YouTube videos or there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of tell all secrets back in the day when I first started. And this has probably been, wow, it, you know, it's going on 20 years now. It's definitely 17 years. And there just wasn't guys giving out secrets. So I said, my thing is like, I'm not the best barbecue cook or, you know, the best pit master in the world, but I believe every, every day I can learn something. If I can learn something, I can share it with somebody. It's going to make us all better cooks. And so that's kind of been the philosophy that we've had. We're just going to share what we learned. And so I started cooking stuff in the backyard. We started, you know, doing a newsletter on it, writing the recipes out, uh, exactly what I was doing. Then we started videoing it, and we just kind of took that over into it. And when, you know, Facebook came along, we started, you know, spreading the word on Facebook. And we've just kind of added a platform every time something new comes out. That's how we got to TikTok, um, you know. And then the podcast came around just because we had went to the National uh, Barbecue Conference and there were some guys giving um, a lecture or, you know, a, a little class on podcast and what they were and all that. And I said, well, you know, we might could do that. We didn't know anything about doing a podcast. We just bought some cheap microphones and cameras and 
uh, took all the stuff out of one little closet in our house and then made us a little podcast room. And we've kind of grown that too over the years. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> I think we've all been on that that same exact journey with the podcast, starting off with some like rinky dink microphones, and then you're like, "Well, time to move up to studio quality." That's, That's kind right. Of what happened with I us. got a question about competition and your competitors. So, is it like a friendly community, or they're like, "All right, those guys, we're coming for them next year." Like, we're you know, is there like a rivalry you have with some of the the cooks out there? Well, barbecues, it's a it's a it's a whole family thing, and I think that's what I love about it. I mean, we're all. You know, brothers and sisters, one big family while we're out there cooking, except for those two hours during tourney. And then don't ask for a favor. Don't ask for a handout. They wouldn't throw water on you if you was on fire during during tourney time. But after that, it's all good. Yeah. So, and, I mean, you're going to meet some of the best. And that's one thing I love about barbecue, man. You, it's it's just a great community. You're going to meet some of the best people that you've ever met in your life. I mean, it's there's guys that'll do anything for you, you know, and, and we see it all the time. And. And, and there's something special about that. Barbecue brings people together, and it's usually about having a good time and fellowship and friends and, and you know, throw in a little barb and you're good to go. For sure. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that you had mentioned earlier about there not being a whole lot of content out there, and you were saying, well, I mean, dispelling some secrets, I guess that's the same thing and it's analogous in our world about giving out your mash bill and telling how you age stuff, which... At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because it's all me depending on environment variables and how you control it and what you're doing. And so, because it was kind of the same thing. Like I remember, you know, Aaron Franklin puts out how he does his brisket. However, there's still lines out every single day of getting brisket over at Franklin's Barbecue in Austin, even though he tells you exactly how he makes it. So were you nervous about putting out content and what people were going to say if they were going to judge how you were doing barbecue? Well, I mean, you always have that thought in your head, but I let it roll off. I mean, if I would have stopped just because people didn't agree with what I was doing, it, I would have never made it anywhere because um, a lot of those competition guys made fun of me. When I go to contests, I'd be like, hey, what are you doing, man? This is the dumbest thing ever. Why would you tell somebody what you're doing? And, you know, they didn't think it was serious. And they would say, oh, you're making your little videos again. What do you think you're, you know? And it was, I mean, it was just a whole big thing of, of that, but. I didn't let any of it discourage me. If you if you get caught up in the comments or what other people are saying about you, you'll never get anywhere. You know, we try not to look at that. I mean, I try to answer comments, and it's very rare that we delete comments just because you know a bad comment means somebody watched it. So <laughs> a good watch is the same as a bad watch in my book. But but uh, you know, it's it, I just kind of let it roll, man, and do our thing. I think I think we're better off that way in life if you just kind of do what you love and what you're passionate about and. Don't don't care about what other people say about it. Of course, there's going to be people that hate what you're doing, or you know, want to throw salt in your game. But that's that's all right. So even barbecue has snarky fans like barbecue. Exactly. Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I was about to say. I, I know myself, and you know, I, I read because I'm I'm terrible at it. I read every single comment and every single thing that comes through, and I know Fred gets the to hear the 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 bad end of things as well. Because anytime we review a bourbon or talk about a bourbon people usually want to slam us or tell us that, you know, that's not right. I didn't get that. How can you support them? You can't even find the bottle anywhere. And I almost kind of get jealous of everything that goes on in barbecue because it's like, hey, I'm just going to share a recipe whether you like it or not. As as long as you don't overcook it, everything should be okay. (laughs) And you can always say you screwed it up probably, you know, it wasn't my (laughs) fault. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it goes back to, you know, being the variables like you were talking about with, with, with making bourbon. Um, Barbecue, I don't, it never turns out the same way for me twice. I could do, you know, that, and that's the hard thing about it. It's challenging. There's so many factors that go into turning out just what's absolutely perfect, what's going to win something that, you know, it, it it doesn't matter. If somebody's cooking it the same way as you or not, nine times out of 10, they'll never, it'll never turn out the same. Oh, I know. I know. So, you know, one of the big reasons I, I had you on here is because, you know, I've watched a few videos of you and uh, you're, you're pouring yourself some, some Eagle Rare, like I said, E.H. Taylor or something like that. So kind of talk about how you got into bourbon a little bit. Well, <laughs> I've always liked drinking bourbon since college, I guess, since I can remember, man. Um, you know, in those back in those days, it was just Jim Beam. It was cheap stuff. We could, but I guess as you age, you know, you kind of develop a little bit more palate and you can afford a little bit better bottle. And I've, I've always been a bourbon fan. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's been my go-to if I'm not, you know, if I, if I want to have a, you know, a cocktail, it's usually going to be a bourbon drink. Now I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed to drinking a, a margarita at the Mexican joint or something like that. But if I have my choice to sit down, want to relax, uh, you know, a good pour of bourbons is usually what I'm going with. 
and I'm not like a super expensive, fancy guy. I'm not that, you know, I just, I just know what I like. Yeah. One of the things about bourbon and barbecue, it sure goes well together. You know, I mean, it's a great, it's a great pairing, but I have, uh, I have found probably the best place for bourbon in the recipes is probably the sauce. Where are you, where are you putting bourbon in your recipes? Uh, well, you know, we, the Jack Daniels, um, folks hold a big, con- it's a world championship invitational contest they've had every year for God, I don't know how many years, probably going back to the early eighties, late seventies. I've judged that. And it's very weird because people are watching you eat and they want your, they want your ribs after you're done and they will eat <laughs> your leftover ribs. It, it's, it, it freaks me That's out crazy. every time. Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't get, I could get down with that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, sauces is definitely a place where, where I try to incorporate, um, you know, some bourbon flavors and I've had a lot of success. Um, you know, and a lot of times it's, you know, it's adding it, adding it, cooking off the alcohol and you're left with that great flavor, you know, um, that the, the bourbon can add to a sauce and it just pairs well with the glaze. When we brush that on pork or, you know, you can put it on chicken, beef, anything, it's going to give you that flavor. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's just unique characteristic. And a lot of people say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, they have inversions to cook them with the alcohol and all that. And you're not, you're not adding alcohol to your meat or to whatever you're doing. It's actually just the flavors, the complexities that you get from, from whatever kind of, you know, um, alcohol you're using, which in my case, most of the time it's bourbon or whiskey. It gives a new meaning to the word drunk chicken then. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) That's what to say. I was like, I don't know if you could sit there and brine a, brine a chicken and bourbon and just get a few extra bottles, pour them in a, in a, in a five gallon bucket and kind of see what happens. Yeah. But it just in general, like, you know, when you've tried to, when I've tried to use bourbon in a marinade, you know, something just, especially with pork, it just never turns, it makes it a little rubbery, if you will. I don't know. I mean, I thought there might be, you might have like a super, super secret of a sneaking bourbon in there outside of a sauce. Uh, you know, maybe it's just drinking it while you're making it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's really the only way I've ever tried to incorporate it other, you know, other than having a drink with the finished product. I think mm-hmm. that's where, you know, where it really shines, where if you're sitting down with the some really good ribs or a good piece of brisket and you've got some bourbon, you know, on the side to, to kind of chase, chase it down. It just goes with it. All right. Well, we'll play a little game here. So I'll, I'll, I'll say a, a type of meat and I'll let one of y'all kind of say, what do you think? What bourbon would pair it better? All right. So, so right. brisket. Ugh. Yeah. I'm going to let y'all go first. I'm going to learn something here. I'm probably going to say Woodford. It, you know, I'm going to go, I'm just, I'm going to assume it's a Texas style brisket. Texas uh, style, just uh, you know, just salt and pepper, kind of, kind of okay. basic. So I feel like that's going to need something with a little bit of a woodier backbone to it to kind of uh, hold up with some of that smoke. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Maker's Forty Six. That's what I was going to say. Well, I was going to say Maker's. I was going to say some little sweeter, a softer to stand up to the the brisket. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, we'll do another one here. But about um, about chicken wings, smoked chicken wings. <laughs> First of all, I just want a big old plate of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Love smoked chicken wings. Probably going to get a Buffalo Trace or something like that for me. A little bit sweeter kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, something a little yeah. sweeter to go with the wings. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say something grain forward, um, you know, because the 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 skin, the, there's a chicken wings, that, that skin, if it's nice and crispy, it, um, it has a, a really nice, like, uh, oily crunch to it, uh, and I like uh, I, I liken that to like a, a potato chip kind of like crunch, you know, a softer potato chip. But so uh, it, it's kind of a a feel thing. But I like the way grain forward bourbons feel on my palate with with something like that. So I'm going to go with uh, a Penelope uh, four grain <laughs> cast strength. You love those four grains. Yeah, he does. I do. A big I do. Fan of them. <laughs> big fan. What about you, Ryan? I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, here. I mean, God, really anything. But I'll. I'm trying to think with chicken wings. Are we doing dry rub? Wet? What are we doing? <laughs> uh, uh, we'll stick with the. Uh, we'll stick with dry rub. A dry rub. Okay. Man, I'm probably gonna stay more sweeter, but a little more heat. Uh, probably do like Weller 107, something like that. There you go. Still in the Buffalo Trace family. I yeah. guess it's a good question, Malcolm. What do you prefer? Just going straight dry rub? Or do you prefer the saucing on it? 
on a wing, man, I'm a, I'm a dry rub guy. Yeah, me too. I like it. I like it all to be on there, especially if you're doing them on the smoker. Now, it's one thing if you're if it's fried chicken wing, like you get at a wing joint. Of course, we're gonna toss them in the sauce, but but I want it to all be baked on that skin and get that skin, uh, like Fred was mentioning, to where it's almost got a little bit of a crunch to it because you've cranked that heat up at the end after you've rendered that fat underneath it, and it really plays well with dry seasoning. So you get a ton of flavor on the outside. I mean, you know, when you're eating wings, it's all about flavor. There's not a ton of meat on them. It's skin and flavor a lot of times, <laughs> and so that's that's where I'm at. And mm. I've got a hot rub that that really goes. It makes an awesome chicken wing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I'm a pure like just dry rub person myself. So even on ribs, like I hardly put sauce on them because I I really like the the rub to stand out, and that's where I want what to shine. You know, at the end of it, what's what's your kind of uh, take on that as well? Oh yeah, no, I'm. I'm I've had so much sweet barbecue in my competition days that you get burnt out on it. And it seems like you know, here in here in our contest, it's play it's almost like it's a sauce game. Who can get it the sweetest? So I tend like if I'm eating it at home, if I'm cooking something for for me and Shell and my son to eat, we're usually making dry. Whether it's Texas style brisket, whether it's a good spicy chicken wing, you know, chicken skin with skin with the seasoning on the outside, or even if it's dry ribs Memphis style. We're, you know, we're, we're going to add, we're going to have our sauce on the table. That way, if you want to do some dabbing in it, you can, but the flavor of the meat and the seasonings on the outside and the way the smoke combines with it, that's what barbecue is all about, man. I feel like, uh, I feel like sauce is like a secondary finish. It masks, you're trying to mask something, you know, the the dry rubs, like straight cash finish, you know, you let the whiskey shine, you let the the meat, meat and rub shine. That's a that's a pretty good analogy, Ryan. I like that one. You know, and it's it's funny you'd mentioned, you know, making something at home. I, I almost look at this as when I talk to like contractors and stuff like that, and they come over and they say like, oh, and my wife, you know, she wants me to go and do something around the house. And I'm working on houses all day. I don't want to work on houses anymore. Uh, so, well, you know, with you, like you're, you're, you're making recipes, you're, you're putting stuff out there, uh, making content, you know, does it get old making stuff at home? Would you just rather go out and Eat at eat at a restaurant? No, I mean I love cooking, so that's and that's a, I get inspiration from a lot of it. I mean we do go out sometimes, and but I guess when you've you know cooked as much as I have on the grill or in a smoker, it's like you're let down a lot of times if you go out to get meat like that. I mean, if, <laughs> so we go for something different usually when we go out, but. Um, if we're, you know, if I'm, if I'm at home, I'm still got a grill fired up and, and I'm, you know, working on recipes, trying something different, whether it's cooking fish or cooking chicken, some, you know, obscure way that I don't normally do or something like that. Or even if it's just a good old steak, you don't ever get tired of a ribeye. I think. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's my love language. So Malcolm, when I was writing the book on certified Angus beef, I got to go to all these like old butcher shops and old grocery stores and there, you know, the meat world, there's a big influence of chains and everything, but the meat world and rib world, it still has a really popular kind of independent butcher shop uh, style. Do you, do you have a few uh, butcher sh- shops around the country that you really, that you really like? Definitely. I think um, I've got, I've just, I guess in the past, I don't know, two or three years, uh, my competition cooking led me for trying to find a, the best brisket that I could find. And I met this uh, uh, gentleman named Kevin Green down in Pensacola, Florida, who's got the butcher shop. And he probably sells more Wagyu brisket than, than, than just about any butcher shop in the country. He ships it everywhere. And these competition guys started cooking his A9 briskets and they are just phenomenal. So um, I didn't know a whole lot um, about, you know, of course we've got some local butcher shops here in Memphis and things like that, but, but they don't really specialize in, in beef and exotic cuts and things like a lot of these other guys do. So, uh, once I met Kevin, man, my eyes were open to what's, what's going on out there and, and meat that that's available. Um, and, and, you know, and since I've started cooking and doing recipes with it, it seems like there's a lot more stuff has, has became readily available because of shipping and, you know, been, been able to get stuff to you overnight in a lot of cases. And so uh, that wasn't always the case back in the day when I mean, we, we were, we were pretty much um, fixed with what we could get at say Sam or Costco's or fresh market or somewhere like that, or, or a local butcher shop if you're lucky to have one. But the, the sad thing is a lot of those local butcher shops are gone. 
you don't see you know you don't see them as often. The guys just aren't cutting meat anymore. It's a lost art. Um, you know, they're they're I've I've seen a you know a few that are doing well that have kind of took on this resurgence since people have wanting to know where their food's coming from and they're wanting to eat local. So I'm hoping that's going to be a trend and we're going to see more of that continue. But there for a while, everything's prepackaged meat. Even when you go to you know Sam's and Costco, th- th- those places they're not cutting meat. It's all coming in cryovac, you know. So you miss out on a lot of these specialty cuts, like I've been turned on, like the certified Angus beef hanger steaks. Um, you know, some of these Chuck Chuck steaks that that people never see, or Denver steaks. Things were the things that were like butchers' close held secrets. A lot of times they would take them home and feed their families with them because people didn't know about them. Those are those are those are cuts of meat that are just absolutely delicious. They don't cost near as much as a ribeye or fillet. You know, they're lesser they're lesser known cuts that you just never had access to. So, so I've learned that from hanging out with Kevin down at the butcher shop and getting to go down there and, and you know learn his operation. Yeah, I think that is something that we we certainly miss here in Louisville. There's there is a butcher shop around us, but you know when you go and you you, you buy a fillet, and I don't want to you know, diss anybody, but I've I've got this. I've got this mantra that if you go and you buy a filet and it's wrapped in bacon, I don't want that filet, right? Like <laughs> I, I want, like I want something that's you know a solid, like at least you know eight to sixteen ounces, like a, a good, good hearty filet. And you shouldn't just you shouldn't buy a filet. That's your problem. You maybe those. that's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fillet guy. I'm sorry, I just am. I like it. And now, don't yeah. get me wrong. Like I love my bone in fillets. I will pay extra for that bone in when I go to a steakhouse. I think it's he's, delicious. He's missing out, Malcolm. He need he needs ribeye. You know, he came over one night. I cooked him a Snake River tomahawk. I I think I changed. Maybe it changed his mind. <laughs> and so, Malcolm, you know a, a thing or two about meat, and this is something that I've I've read and heard about on uh, different Facebook forums and stuff like that. Because you know, you mentioned Costco a few times, and. You know, Costco has uh, their USDA choice, but they also have their Prime that comes in the you know the the blue package. But I've heard that their their consideration of Prime isn't necessarily what Prime would mean to uh, like you know say a, a butcher shop or to the rest of the people that are in the industry. Spirits of French Lick pays tribute to the many distilleries that once dotted the southern hills of Indiana. They focus on using the best practices of those early times in balance with the improved methods of today, delivering the finest handcrafted bottled and bond bourbons to an audience that's eager for an alternative to the big guys. Their distilling philosophy is balanced between the distiller's art and the contribution of the barrel, time, and patience to bring you an unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. Spirits of French Lick's motto is simple, respect the grain. You can find all Spirits of French Licks products and their new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. And check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to always drink responsibly. Savor every drop of summer at Total Wine & More because they've got a sizzling lineup of pours for the great outdoors. Get ready for the holiday weekend with their top 12 wines under $15 and beat the heat with refreshing bourbon cocktails. So why not serve a brown derby made with bourbon, grapefruit, and honey at your next barbecue? Then taste your way to a new flavorite. With over 500 bourbons, Total Wine & More is the place for whiskey lovers. Looking for something new? Well, check out McFarland's Reserve Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Extra wheat in the mash bill makes it especially smooth. You're sure to find cool prices on over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers in-store, or at TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery has been lifting America's spirit since 1935. They celebrate American whiskey's rich traditions, guide its evolution, and champion its exciting future. For Heaven Hill, whiskey is more than a profession. It's a personal passion that is poured into every bottle, shared with newcomers and aficionados alike. So whether you enjoy the simple pleasure of Evan Williams' bottle and bond, or savor that uniquely satisfying experience, of a rare single barrel bourbon like Elijah Craig 18 year old, you'll find a home at Heaven Hill. If you want to learn more about the craft and techniques of making quality American whiskey, check out the educational resources and sign up for their newsletter at heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely and drink wisely. Cheers. You know, Costco has uh, their USDA choice, but they also have their prime that comes in the 
you know, the, the blue package. But I've heard that their, their consideration of prime isn't necessarily what prime would mean to uh, like, you know, say a, a butcher shop or to the rest of the people that are in the industry. Well, you know, the way I understood and, and uh, Fred may could lean some on this because I learned it from the CAB folks. So I got the chance to go up there. They're, they grade those steaks at the packing plant. There's usually a USDA official or someone in there. And as the carcasses come down the line, they take samples of that loin. And if it meets the standards, it meets the standards. And they're grading it on, um, you know, fat content a lot of times, age of the animal, the weight of the carcass. There's, there's several criteria that, that makes it prime. But overall, the best from a consumer standpoint, it's probably marbling is the one we're most familiar with. Um, and, you know, and there's different, like certified Angus beef is totally different because they have such a higher standard for their grade that their prime and USDA prime is totally different. Well, this is, I'm going to get to geek out on uh, some of my old school knowledge uh, on beef here. I'm very excited. So first of all, that US, so a lot of people have a misunderstanding of the USDA scale. Uh, that is something that the the packing plants pay for. It is not a safety measurement. So the there used to be there used to be a, a, a larger scale, and they basically uh, cut they cut it down. Uh, they added they added a layer into choice in the 1970s. There's actually three grades within choice, and if you're just getting regular USDA choice. You could actually get something that is arguably select level, and it's based on it is all ba it's based on marbling. Well, there's a few other things, but marbling is the main component. But certified Angus beef is the upper two thirds of choice. They also have to be their their cattle have basically have to be fifty one percent Angus. So it's kind of like um, <laughs> no way, kind of like bourbon, <laughs> uh, you know. So and they have to have black hide. But um, the, you know, Angus grow well, they marble well, but their, you know, their flavor profile, you know, fits most Americans. But um, I, I'm a big fan of some of the Hereford breeds as well. You know, I think they can taste really good on barbecue in barbecue. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, all kinds of things that go with it. And with the with the introduction of Wagyu and that crazy marble, that's all that's too much marbling for me. Uh, I've had a lot of Wagyu, no. and I've come to the conclusion, nope. I'm not a fan. Oh, you're the only uh, one. I was about to say. By the way, first <laughs> off, this is a uh, this is another side of Fred Minnick that we all got to kind of see today. So very happy to see about that. <laughs> well, I, I like what I. So let me let me let me point out. I like Wagyu, but I need it. I need it thinly sliced. I don't like it in like the steak portion, like we would normally get, like in New York Strip. I mean, that's like I can feel my heart. Like checking out as I'm as I'm, <laughs> it's just too too much marbling for me. All right, Malcolm, where do you stand on the wagyu? Um, some of the Japanese A5 is the best beef I've ever put in my mouth, but you can't eat you can't eat that much. I'm talking about an ounce or two. It's yeah. about all you can eat. So you're talking about having it in strips. Yes, that's the way you have to eat it because it's it's mainly fat marble with bling. It's it's, it's the opposite <laughs> of what you think. Now. The Wagyu that we're cooking in contest is um, primarily Australian Wagyu, and it's great. At, the sky's the limit on how that. Who knows? They don't really have to, to call it Wagyu. There's no stipulation according to the USDA that it has to be. It's really a marketing technique. It's a tactic. Um, but these are genetic. You know, the, the genetics they're using are are true Wagyu beef from Japan. At some point, they're just crossing them with different breeds to get the marbling they want. Um, the Australian is not at, it's marbled high, but I would say it may be just a bit, a little bit above prime if you're, if you're used to eating prime steak. So there's a lot of marbling there, but there's still a lot of lean. It's, it has really good flavor. And from my experience with it, it's more forgiving because if you overshoot your temps, like if you cook a brisket a little bit past where it needs to go, it's okay because the fat content is going to keep the moisture in the meat. Uh, where if you're cooking a prime or a choice, man, you've done ruined it. You've dried it completely out. So that's why a lot of the guys have went to it. It's not so much for flavor as it is for the moisture content. Um, when it comes down to steaks and stuff like that, man, you give me a good, uh, good CAB steak, I'll put that up against anybody's, or 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 just a good prime at a steakhouse. Um, it could it could be Angus Hereford, whatever. The um, that that'll go with the, you, you don't see it 
in the ribeyes or the fillets or, or the, 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 the more known cuts. I don't think that's where Wagyu shines that we're getting. It's, it's the lesser cuts that's coming off the shoulder, uh, the, the inside skirt meat, all that stuff. If you taste it, it's fantastic. I mean, it's phenomenal, and it's, you can cut it with a fork. So a lot of those, like if you if you want to if you want to explore and try some of the wagyu, look for some of those lesser known cuts to try to compare that to what you're getting from Sam's, Costco, wherever, just regular choice meat, and you're going to see a world of difference. So I can save my hundred and fifty dollars Snake River Tomahawk wagyu ribeyes. Yeah, Let's go go to. I mean, there's nothing wrong it. with it. You want to cook that once a year, you know, but there's <laughs> nothing wrong with it. But go get you a Denver steak. Or Trace Major or something like that, and then compare. The, and it's like, man, this is as good as any regular tomahawk I've ever had. So I saw you drilled the hole in your tomahawks. What's your preferred yeah. method for doing a tomahawk? Is that- man, so I used to kind of reverse sear them to where you would put some smoke on them and then throw them over high heat at the end. But since I started hanging them in the drum smoker, the flavor that you get is phenomenal. Because you get that smoked, it's almost, if you've had beef rib, like a really good Texas beef rib, that's the flavor you get from them, but you can control it. You can cook them mid-rare, which is where I like to eat my ribeye, and it's just, it has all that great flavor of a brisket or of a a, a perfectly cooked dino rib, you know, the big giant beef rib that you're getting in a steak form. And that's, that's, that's my new favorite way to cook tomahawks. Yeah, I would agree. That's one way to do it. One way to slice a cow. (laughs) Hey Malcolm, what do you what in in alcohol? You know they've they've dealt with people trying to tell tell uh, whether it's government or religion, telling people not to drink uh, forever. In the last uh, couple decades, we've seen a uh, we've seen a huge shift of people telling folks not to eat meat. Uh, how do you how what do you think about that? And do you uh, I mean do you think this trend is going to really take hold in the next uh, decade or so? You know, my, my right off the top of my head, I say, that's, that's okay, go ahead and do it, because that's more meat for us, us meat eaters. <laughs> but you have to be concerned, because when the government's getting involved, and they're, you know, they're, they're giving all this money and grants to, to people to research and develop all this impossible meat, meat substitute, or plant-based meats and all that, you've got to feel like there's some kind of push to to get society off off of meat for some reason. Now, do I think it'll ever happen or happen in our time? No, I don't see it. Maybe, you know, maybe generations from now. But I think as long as you've got, I would, I don't know the exact number, but I would guess it is probably ninety percent of the country is a carnival. You know, considers themselves meat eaters. I mean, vegetarians and vegans is a very small number. I would think as a whole of the populace. I have a lot of friends who are vegans because their wives are, and when they're around me, they're just like stuffing their face with steak and ribs. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I always heard they uh, eat meat when they get drunk too. They like, yeah, <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just I, I can't believe that that we're going to get rid of the American farmer, the American cattle farmer, the American hog farmer, the chicken farmer, and so much of so much of the food we raise here in the United States uh, feeds the rest of the world. You know, so for to to take out our meat supply, I just I don't see it. I mean, well, we all I don't think we'd be better off if we stopped eating meat. I really do think it's part of your should be part of our diet. I mean, you know, if you want to say everything in moderation, even moderation, but but uh, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stop drinking my bourbon and eating my steak. <laughs> I mean, it's it's becoming a religion though, you know. And, oh yeah, oh, it is. Th- and the the impossible burger thing. I, I have no qualms whatsoever with people wanting to eat, you know, eat how they want. But I, 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 t- I do take issue with the fact that the Impossible Burger is basically just imitating a burger. I mean, to eat carrots, eat, you know, and, there, right. and, and there's so there's so much sodium and stuff in these things and soy. And and it's like they're worse and people need protein. And the the you know, you talk to a dietitian. Uh, they see a lot and you doctors, they see, you know, imbalances that is being caused by soy and things that are being used to replace it. So I think there's just, uh, there's a, there's a reaction happening to meat based on quote environmental reasons or whatever. And uh, it's disturbing. It's disturbing to me because it's, I think it's having a 
adverse reaction that people uh, do not uh, understand. All right. I agree. Back to non-political <laughs> dietary uh, discussion. Wait, is that political? Uh, I didn't think that was political. Oh, God. It's not, it can be. You know, I it, mean, you got to understand, you, bourbon is vegan. So there are right. probably, probably a lot of vegans that listen to the podcast, too. So well, unless, I heard a lot uh, of unless, plants to make it. Back yeah. in the day, they used to put hog lard in the uh, in the fermenters to you know keep it from foaming out. So, oh, yummy! All right, <laughs> stainless steel. We don't need that anymore. So, Malcolm, you're stranded on an island, and you you only can choose one uh, cooking apparatus to to barbecue with. What are you going with? Oh, well, that's gonna be tough because I've seen he's got oh, an arsenal. Man. I know, yeah. I know. Ah, that, that is tough, man. I would probably I would probably say my Weber kettle, man. Woo! It's the most versatile. It really yes. is. I mean, it's the number yes. one set of grill for a reason, but I can do anything I want with it. We'll call it and plate. it's small enough if I'm by myself. I don't need a big, huge smoker. I need something that I can grill on, that I can smoke on, that you I can't can, you know. carry around a big old green egg ceramic. Yeah, you heavy, can't tote man. that. Yeah, you can catch hell rolling that in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. That is true. So I guess, uh, you know, talking about those, those arsenal of grills, you know, how do you choose – you know, when you're coming up with recipes and what you're going to barbecue, like, how do you choose what you're going to go for? Because you've got, you've got the pit barrel, you got the Weber, you got the green egg. I know you've got a little bit of everything. So how do you kind of choose which one you're going to kind of uh, pick as your tool today? Well, I, I try to rotate it out because I realize that not every, not everybody has, you know, the same grill at home. That's, that's my whole thinking behind it. If I can showcase that I can do a recipe on any of the grills that I have, I, I usually try to write the recipe in a ways that you could do it on whatever you have. And, and I say that in my recipes uh, or my videos, you know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to cook it on the same grill I have. You can do it the same one as long as you follow the technique, stay to the same time and same temperature. That's what it's all about. So, um, you know, I, I, now I guess I have a bad habit or my wife calls it a habit of collecting grills and not getting rid of a grill. And that's how I've amassed so many over the years. But, uh, and I love every one of them. I don't really have one favorite. They all have their uses. And, and I'd like to think that, that I could fire them all, you know, I can fire each one of them up and cook something that's fantastic. And that's really what I want to show people that doesn't matter your budget, doesn't matter what grill you have, you can cook the same thing. It just takes learning that grill, learning how to manage the fire and you following a solid, you know, following a solid technique. It's all about time and temperature, right? That's it. And I think one of the kind of the, the new things that's starting to catch a big fad right now is the Blackstone. People are all about this griddle action. I've seen that, man. There's a ton of them on TikTok. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, Blake's all about it, too. I mean, they, they're there's our buddy Blake. You don't know him, but, you know, he's uh, he's he's all about the Blackstone. There's people that are doing, you know, they're making their own kind of onion volcanoes on it, you know, yeah. trying to be, you know, <laughs> chefs and everything like that, too. <laughs> Doing the bocce style at home. They're fun to cook on. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I love a good smash burger. I mean, they're they, they're great. I mean, you know, it, it's never gonna take the place of my barbecue pit. That's for sure. But they have a place. I mean, you can feed a lot of people on them. They're they're you know, it's 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 kind of a little showman grill, but there's nothing wrong with them at all. Anything that gets you outside cooking, I'm all for. Yeah, we've we've talked about some of like the consumer grade grills. What do you have as your kind of barbecue pit that you you kind of go to? Um. Well. If I had to pick one, like get all, get rid of all of my grills and I could only keep one of them, I'd probably be my old Hickory CTO because it's, it's more of a commercial grill. I know that I can take it and go make some money and feed my family. You know, it's, it's a pit that I can load up with 36 butts at one time. Wow. I can cook a case of ribs on it, you know, and it's, it's a workhorse. So it's, you know, I, I don't use them a lot in videos anymore. I mean, I've got a lot of videos on old Hickory. It's just, I understand that not everybody has that grill in their backyard. So I try to showcase stuff that people have, you know, or, or have, have access to, but you'll always see it sitting back there. If you notice, if you watch any of my videos, you can see the big old hickory sitting kind of in the corner. Yeah. I was about to say, I don't have a need to be smoking 32 butts at one time. Yeah, it usually takes time. me about, <laughs> yeah. It usually takes me about a week to go through one when I do cook it, but, uh, I'll, I'll throw another one at you because I've seen this, at least on the green egg forms that people have, uh, at least with the the butts, a turbo method. Are you a, you're a turbo guy or low and slow when it comes to um, that, I think? You know, I'm, now I'm I'm a low and slow guy. Always have been. But there's something to be said to be able to to put a butt on a drum and cook it in four or five hours. There's no, you know, it, it, can you do it? Yeah. 
Do I think you get a better product in the end by taking your time and rendering these these lesser, these tougher cuts or these really marbled cuts down and letting that fat melt low and slow? I think the product's better on a low and slow cook, but can you turn out something that's good and edible hot and fast? Yeah, you can. I mean, there's you know, there's something to be said for it. I've, yeah. Hey, I've been there. I've 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 been behind and had to fireball something and <laughs> and you know get it get it on there for a couple of hours, wrap it up in full the old Texas crutch and, and let it roll at three hundred seventy five four hundred degrees and get it done. You can make some magic happen. <laughs> oh yeah, been there at parties where you're like you got it on for six hours and everybody's like uh dinner and you're like shit. I'd say like, <laughs> that's right. I'm stalled at 160 or whatever. <laughs> well, I, you know, I would <laughs> say push this through. there's something low and slow. You have more room to correct your mistakes on a long, low and slow cook. You know, on a hot and fast cook, it's all or nothing. You're, you know, you're, you're feeding the heat to it. You've got it fireballing. If it turns out great, if you ruin it, there's, you know, there's no room for error. I mean, there's not a lot of room for error when you're doing that. Right on. So we'll, uh, I've got two more questions for you. So one is, one is probably going to, you're going to have to probably think about this one a little bit because you might have a lot of people that might hate you. Oh. Uh. Is, uh, are you using pellet grills? Is that cheating? I don't know, man. I've got three of them in my backyard. Um, there's a place for them. Pellet, so pellet grills have been out. I guess Traeger probably came out with the first one in the late 70s. Uh, the technology's been around for a while. Um, they became really popular here lately. Um, I guess and a lot of it has to do with probably Traeger, but Traeger sold to a to another company, and that company started dumping a bunch of money into marketing and pushing them out there. And so now we have a ton of pellet companies. There's a lot of great ones. You've got you know your Rectex and your um, Gorillas and, and, and yeah Green Mountains. There's I mean there's a, there's a ton of them. Camp Chefs. They're they're all you know kind of in that same Traeger ball field. Uh, Traeger's definitely the the Weber grill of the pellet industry. You know they're the one that's been around and the big dog everybody's chasing. But um, the way I look at them is you are they as good as say cooking on a barrel or cooking on a or traditional stick burner or something like that where you're actually burning a fire, you're adding wood to it. Uh, you're not going to get they're they're not you're not going to get that same flavor on a pellet grill. You're just not. But what you do get is ease of use, and it's great for people getting into barbecue, to, to into smoking and grilling, or someone that wants one pit to do it all, where you can actually low and slow cook on it, or you can fire it up like a lot like you can your egg and, and cook at high temps too. So that's what they're great about. Um, they're great because you don't have to know any fire management to run a pellet grill. Yeah, there's no you know there's really no no more skill than turning on your oven at home. You're setting a temperature. Uh, as long as you put pellets in it, it's going to come up to temp, and you're going to be able to cook. So, um, you know, I, th- I think I think they really have their place. I use them. I use them a lot. Not not so much for my low and slow barbecue, but but uh, more for you know just cooking in general outside. Instead of firing up my oven, I'll fire up my pellet grill, run it at 350. I'm baking bread on it. We're cooking pizzas. We're you know we're doing all kinds of stuff with it, and that's great too. So I think there's a place for them, and you're going to see more of them. I mean they're the the technology's coming along with them and people people love them. Yeah, I mean, I will say I am jealous of that because when you got that three to five a.m. brisket, you got to go out there and you're like, oh shit, I got to re- restart this fire. Like <laughs> it it went out on me. Even though even though you fill that whole damn thing up with charcoal, it, it ends up going out on you no matter what. Yeah. I still think it's cheating. So <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I'm, do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's it's yeah. It's that's a it's a religious issue. We won't we won't touch it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, you know, kind of the last one is because I know you're a big cocktail guy, uh, big cocktail and bourbon. So if you got a, a a nice go to for your bourbon cocktail, what's your uh, what's your favorite? Um, besides just drinking it with a piece of ice, I'm yeah. probably gonna go. I mean, that's like a cocktail. Isn't it? I'm yeah. probably gonna go an old fashioned man. I'd like a good old fashioned. Yeah, um, here. you can't, you can't, hey, can't knock a mint julep, especially in, in May, right? That's a, that's a good one. But if I'm out, if I'm out and we're ordering drinks, I'm probably gonna, you know, sitting down at dinner or something. If, after I have me a bourbon on the rocks, I'm gonna have me an old fashioned or something like that, or sazerac, something to finish out the night, something to add a little bit of sweetness to it, but still, 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 it's heavily, uh, heavenly bourbon. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, do you uh, do you yeah. choose like a higher proof bourbon when you're yeah. choosing your cocktails too? Um, you know, I stick in the ones I know. I mean, if you know, I don't know what higher 
Booker's is about as higher proof as I'll go. I consider that pretty hot. I've got a bottle of it at home that we that we get out. I don't drink it all the time. Um, I like I like Taylor. Um, I you know I, I'm a I'm a Woodford guy though. If I'm drink just my everyday call, I consider it Woodford. It's a really good, easy drinking bourbon, readily available. You don't you know you're not gonna break the bank on it. I mean, it's all great bourbon. I, I I've yeah. noticed that uh, you know you're you're using E. H. Taylor a lot, at least around here. That's uh, that's a needle in a haystack. So yeah. if you can if you can find it where you're at, I say keep buying while you can. I grab it every time I see a bottle. That and Blanton's, man. We don't see Blanton's very often. I found three bottles last week, so I snagged them up. And I think it, you know, I think more of the internet and the popularity of it right now is what's hurting that. I don't know if they're making less. I think people are buying it and just hoarding it. So you, you're you talking know. about Blanton's, yeah, yeah, or that current the Taylor, uh, even Eagle Rare. I mean, it's it's rare. You know, it's it's rare sometimes to see a bottle of Eagle Rare in Memphis. Um, Welcome so, to our world, Mel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Very yeah. much. It's the the rat race of keeping everybody happy with Buffalo Trace products. Yeah. So hey, so I got a question for you guys. What could you recommend? You know, of something that you guys have tried that's gonna, you know, be in the flavors that you think I, that you kind of know that I like that I might be able to find. That's the question I get all the time, and I don't have any recommendations for people. You know, yeah. If you like the Woodford, you'd probably like some of the old foe, uh, like uh, Prohibition series. So like uh, the was it nineteen twenty or nineteen twenty nineteen ten? Yeah, probably like. Um, I was gonna suggest the early times bottled and bond. Yes. I don't know if it's made its way down there, but. I don't think That's you can get one. much better for a uh, a screw top 14 or what is it? Probably like a $20 bottle that only comes in a one liter. I don't think it gets much better than that at that price range. That's kind of like the old granddad. I've got, I bought it, the old granddad bottled in bond. It's, it's decent. I mean, it's cheap, but it's, you know, it's not mm-hmm. bad drinking. Yeah. I think one, um, it, you mentioned, where do you, where do you sit with bookers when you add a little lies to it? Where do you sit with that? It's a little on the hot side to me, which, which, I mean, I just think it's got a lot of proof to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's just not, it's not something that I would drink glass after glass. I like to sip it. I like to let the ice mellow it out, let it sit there and kind of get a little, maybe, maybe a splash of water in it mm-hmm. too. And it, and it's really good. It, it, the, I, lo- I love the flavor of it. It just, it finishes hot on my throat. That makes, so that's good to know. That's good to know. So like, I wouldn't do any, recommend anything to you over a hundred proof then. Um, I'd, I'd say take a look at a brand called Evan Williams in particular, uh, either their Bottled and Bond, uh, which is 100 proof, or their Single Barrel, uh, which is 86 proof, uh, and uh, good old-fashioned, regular Knob Creek, man. I think that's a that's a great one that would go head-to-head with Taylor for you. That or Maker's 46 or something like that, too. I, 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 I like flavors. the Maker's 46. Yeah, I keep a bottle of it at home. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Malcolm. We're gonna come down to Memphis. We're gonna drink, eat some barbecue, and next time you come up to Louisville, you can you can see what's behind Fred and all of us have the uh, that times ten in our in our houses. <laughs> so we can definitely awesome. do some bourbon tasting while we have it as well. I would love that, guys. It's been a lot of fun, man. And I'll try to cook up my pit barrel for you. There you well, go. <laughs> and Kenny will try to do something on his egg, and Fred will have his Weber, and we'll see who has the best. I'll, I'll bring the meat. Y'all bring the bourbon. I'm, right. I'm a judge. I'll just be a judge here. There you yeah. go. All right. <laughs> All right. That sounds like a deal. Well, thank you so much, Malcolm, for joining us today. You know, before we kind of sign off, I want to let you give a, a plug to where people can find out more about you and, uh, you know, your YouTube, TikTok, uh, your podcast, everything like that. Yeah, guys, I appreciate it, man. It's been a blast. Um, you can find me at How to BBQ Right. Uh, that's our website. Um, but it's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and like we mentioned earlier, my wife Shell and I do a weekly podcast. It's the How to Barbecue Right podcast. You can find it on Apple, um, on Google, the Google Play Store, any of the places you get your podcasts. It's on there. Um, so yeah, we appreciate it. We've got a great community too, guys, on Facebook. It's called the Let's Get to Cooking. It's a community about how to barbecue right. So if you guys ever get to having some questions, if you know, y'all got my number, just text me. But if you can't find the answer, jump on the community. We'd love to have you chime in with some bourbon advice. I might do that right now. We'll be on a stall at a party, you know, when we're trying to get our our meal right. We'll be like, Malcolm, I need you. 
What do I do? <laughs> I can I got help. 50 hungry guests. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Thank you once again, Malcolm, for being on. Make sure you follow him. Subscribe to his podcast as well. And if you're not already, subscribe to Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts. And also follow us on all the socials. And plus, follow our good buddy Fred Minnick over here. He's got a great YouTube channel as well. With that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. See ya. Like I said, Toodles. <laughs>